Hey guys, Travis here. Thank you all so much for listening. Please subscribe if you haven't yet and hit that notification bell to keep in the loop. Enjoy today's podcast. Today I am overjoyed. I have one of my heroes on the line with me. The amazing James Randi is on the line. For those of you who don't know, James Randi has an international reputation as a magician and escape artist, but today he is best known as the world's most tireless investigator and demystifier of paranormal and pseudoscientific claims. Randy is a pioneer of the modern skepticism movement and a hero of mine, and thank you so much for talking to me today, James. Great pleasure, Travis. And uh, how have you been uh, health-wise and activity-wise? Hey, I've been uh, doing pretty good. I'm uh, in the gym three times a week. I'm traveling the world. I'm I'm trying to eradicate anti-science wherever I can. I'm I'm trying to follow in the James Randi footsteps, if that's even possible. Well, if there's a spray or something like that, <laughs> like a mosquito spray yeah. that we could perfect, I yes. think we, we should all arm ourselves with that. But it's pretty hard to... Uh, to find out where these people are, you know, they're they're under the furniture like spiders, and um, they seem to want to avoid immediate contact. We have to do something about that. Yeah, and we have a bit of a culture now that tries to force those people into hiding, which I don't think is a is a helpful thing. Like I, I'm I'm so in favor of putting bad ideas on stage with reasonable minds so that they can be worked out and and we can potentially see some concessions happen live in front of an audience. Very true. Very true. I agree. Um, and I, I wanted to start with, uh, how are you health-wise? How are things going? Well, I've had a, a few uh, uh, rough spots in my life. After all, I am uh, just a few days short of being 90 years of age. And um, I'm supposed to be dead by now, but I I've refused to go along with that notion, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I think if I do that successfully if long enough, uh, I, I may get a, to be immortal. I didn't say immoral, I said immortal. <laughs> That's, uh, well, I'm so glad you're still with us, James, and it, it was w one of the biggest pleasures of my life is when you came down to Vancouver and I got to spend some time with you and we went to the uh, um, to Science World together and we had, we shared a couple milkshakes and uh, and then you also, you spoke at the Chan Center for Performing Arts in Vancouver uh, about magic and skepticism and I was just so privileged to be a part of that event. I like the way you say, I came down to Vancouver. <laughs> yeah. I guess for it's me, kind of... For me, it's up, you see. <laughs> yes, right. Um, yeah, I guess well, I say that because I grew up way up high in the mountainous regions of uh, British Columbia. And for me, Vancouver is always down. And I think it's just something I, I need to shake. It's a hole in my reasoning. Yes, okay. We have <laughs> to do something about that. Yes. Um, so here's a question. Is the world more skeptical than ever before, or are, are we reverting? Well, I, I think there's an interesting angle to that, Travis. I, I think that we have more groups now, organized groups, who um, are taking the subject more seriously and organizing against uh, belief in the paranormal and the supernatural. Um, I, I don't know whether that's a... a just a delusion of my mind. Uh, I don't, I don't uh, write anything off. I, I can have all kinds of delusions and rather enjoy them, as a matter of fact. But uh, um, I must say, I think that it's a little more organized now, and we've got many groups out there, and I'm sure you could name them off uh, very rapidly as the same way I could. And they're all over the world, in all different continents around the world, and I'm in touch with a great number of them, and I get to speak to them every now and then. And um, I'm encouraged by the fact that they seem to be much better organized than they had been previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think one obvious uh, source would be the Richard Dawkins Foundation. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I know you speak very highly of Richard. Uh, what, what can you tell me um, about your interactions with Richard and what he's meant to your process? Well, I, I've actually 
stayed at Richard Dawkins' home, if you can imagine that. <laughs> and that's outside. I, I shouldn't give a location for it because they're going to start to look it up, you see. Right. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, let's say it's in the UK. That's vague enough, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I had this, such a wonderful time at his home. He had some marvelous artifacts in his home, and uh, I, I was really quite taken with it. I was carried away by it, as a matter of fact, and that experience lasted me a long time. Now, that was several years ago, and I've been in touch with Richard since. He had a bit of a stroke, uh, yes. and that was uh, not welcome at all, of course. I, I'm, I'm against strokes. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. And I'm, and I'm, not ta- I'm not talking golf now. Yeah. I think all of the ideological belief systems on this planet, at least as far as I can tell, are against strokes. So we all have yes. that in common. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll make a note of that. So, okay. I just made a note of it. Um, yeah. Richard is, of course, a, a figurehead in the skeptical uh, field. And uh, I've known him for many, many years. I, I don't, I don't quite know when I met him, but I have been on so many stages with him, uh, and uh, been introduced by him and with him and for him. Uh, that uh, we're old buddies, I guess. Yeah, and and what, what do you think? Uh, he's he's been very effective in demystifying a lot of uh, people of faith um, and and helping them uh, find their way out of uh, religions. Um, it, that that's been an important part of what he's done in modern times. But he's also been, uh, I think, one of the most influential scientific minds uh, in oh, yes. in the past at least. You know, 150 years. So, uh, and what uh, what do you think is special about the way um, Richard delivers science to the public? Well, I think because he's authoritative. Um, I've I've often seen him speaking and been sitting in the front row, and uh, I <laughs> this may just be my imagination, but when he gets a question, which he gets almost every time. Uh, that he steps on stage, uh, and that can be any one of, uh, of 40 questions, of course. Right. But uh, when he gets something like that or a mention of something, um, I think I see him winking at me in the front row. <laughs> because yeah. it's something that speakers like, like Richard and myself, and you too, I'm sure, in your work, uh, you, you have to be very patient with people and uh, don't start out by saying, this is a question I'm always asked. No, don't do it that way. Just raise your eyebrows very slightly <laughs> and uh, express a certain amount of surprise at the introduction of the subject, whatever it may happen to be. Uh, and Richard is very good at that. As a matter of fact, I, I've always admired one thing about him above all. When he gets a question that he's not accustomed to getting from an, uh, an audience member, <laughs> he will pause and even defocus his eyes. I, I'm sure I, I don't stare into his eyes all the time, but um, he, he, he takes a minute, not, not a minute, he takes 30 seconds perhaps to think about the subject. And the answer he gives is so so cogent, it, it's just frightening almost. Uh, he he sounds like he's reading from a textbook. Right. He's not. He's just reading from his memory, from his mind, and often, well, very often, he gets a round of applause for one of those particular kinds of answers, and he certainly deserves it, and he deserves our support in every way that we possibly can. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. I have I have lots of events coming up with Richard, and the way I see him uh, affecting audiences uh, even today, it's it's people are always so quick to shoot up to give him a standing ovation after any discussion he's involved with because he just he he brings so much to the discussion. Yeah, very true, very true, and he's uh, 
he's a teacher after all. And, uh, well, not anymore, but uh, he, um, he'll he always be a teacher. I'm sure that he can't uh, he can't even unwind his tongue long enough to, to have to think about that. Um, he, he's a remarkable intellect, and he almost speaks as if he's reading from a text. And um, I'm, I'm rather jealous of that ability. Yeah, he uh, he's one of those people who can author on the fly, and and like you said, it's yes. like he's reading from a book he's written, but he's just taking the time to uh, uh, put the um, to to reason. I guess is the best is the yes, best way to and, describe and it. I think more speakers, uh, not of Richard's uh, caliber, of course, but um, more speakers. I think in the business of explaining themselves from a stage would do well to to put a pause in there when mm. they're about to answer a question they don't get that frequently. Yeah. And uh, I, I think, I, I hesitate to say this, but I, I may be copying from him. <laughs> <laughs> and if so, I'm copying from a giant. Yeah. And uh, he is one of my giants. Uh, one of, I'd say, six or eight people that I consider to have been a great example for me. Right. Who who would be some of the other ones uh, that have been a big uh, big source of inspiration for you? Oh, well, what's uh, this is difficult for me now. What's the name of the, the chap that he travels with a great deal? Lawrence Krauss. Lawrence Krauss. Yeah. Larry, forgive me. I, I forgot your name for a moment. There. <laughs> and maybe we can edit that. <laughs> but. Uh, Lawrence Krauss, and and the the beautiful thing about Larry Krauss and and Dawkins when they speak as a pair, and I've I've witnessed this several times, uh, luckily, and um, it, it's just such an experience to see the two of them playing off one another and with one another uh, to, to to help one another along. And I've, I've seen them doing uh, lectures where I see three of them in a row, for example, and I see the same sort of moment arrive in, in their uh, speaking duties. And um, I've seen different answers uh, come out from them. And I see Dawkins <clears throat> occasionally looking uh, mildly astonished. And then he breaks into a quiet smile, and I know that he's caught up with it. So, um, and, and this is giving away secrets of uh, how people uh, approach their audiences, of course. But I don't think they'll mind. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think so either. Um, so is there a, a certain pseudoscience that existed when you were younger that is still around? And if, if so, if you can think of any, uh, can we shake it, or, or is it just always going to be around? I, I think, I think that well, when you say when when I was a, a child, for example, um, that's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it's getting to be a longer time as days go by. But uh, no, I I don't think so. I I think that um, there are certain standards. Astrology, for example, um, th this can be so easily dumped on. Uh, it can be so easily just written off the list uh, by by using a, a certain amount of a certain amount of uh, logic and and just ask people how they think that stars that are that are millions in some cases billions of miles away from them and just tiny dots in in the in not, they're not tiny themselves. But they're tiny dots in, in the heavens above. Um, I, I, often, I often even feel that I should speak to them and say, "Well, why, why did you get this reputation of uh, being, you know, if Arcturus is in a certain spot in the sky, um, how did you get the reputation of having some useful knowledge in that fact?" Um, yeah, astrology, I think, is just the most the most daffy uh, notion. Yeah. Now we're using it's slang, I think, but a word like daffy, 
really applies to it, I'm sure. Um, astrology is so easily demolished by just using some common sense. But common sense, now theirs is an expression that I don't hear as often as I should. Uh, if you have a certain note of common sense, you're just applying logic to uh, a situation, uh, to a... Uh, Mm, to, to a circumstance that requires it, and it fits into place so beautifully. I, I'm proud to say that I've, I've had several moments of, uh, <clears throat> of um, revelation for myself uh, when someone will mention a subject like astrology um, or fortune telling or card reading or whatever um, that, that fits so nicely into what I need to address. And um, I, I hope that I do a good job of it. I like to think that I do. And I've been told by applause and uh, by just <laughs> the, the general circumstances that um, I probably do get a good enough reaction. And uh, I finding also that I must say this too, that at my advanced stage, I uh, I tend to wander a little bit in uh, on subjects and uh, in directions, and sometimes I I can get led astray. <laughs> I just uh, yeah, get, yeah. Having, a, having a favorite angle come up to me, yeah, and uh, and and often <laughs> those things happen to to me when I have people in the audience. Uh, who right. um, will hang around after the uh, after the the listening audience? If I'm at a film, for example, um, and I, I hope it's one of mine, <laughs> and uh, I find that there, there's a strange thing that that has happened more and more often recently, and that is we call them the stragglers. Now I usually go to my speaking engagements with my partner, Davey, and um, we'll exchange glances at one another. If we notice that the audience is filing out and waving goodbye over their shoulders or whatever, and we see that some people are not leaving, they're coming down towards the front of the stage. And often they're crying. They're crying because we've said something to them that has hit a spot. I don't know where that spot is. I don't know that I could locate it anatomically. But uh, you, you get people who look up at you with tears in their eyes and will say things like, you just made a big difference in my life. I have to think about this more now. Oh, that's a great moment of victory. Yeah. When you, when you find out that you've actually reached somebody down deep and uh, gotten them thinking about it. And very often I will get tremendously long letters, which I read with great joy from people that, who have come to the foot of the stage and, and said to me, I didn't know about that, or I'll, I'll pay attention to that from now on. That's what I want to do. I want to leave an impression with people. I want them to, to react to what I have had to say. I don't ask them to believe everything I say. No, I have all kinds of crazy ideas that they would probably not agree with at all. But on the other hand, uh, they gave me a chance to address them. And that's the most I can ask of them. And I have to, to pay them back by giving them very good answers. Yeah, and I mean, you've, uh, and and even in the, the circumstances that they're not coming down to the front of the stage, just people who are still watching your content, young people online, on YouTube, seeing all of your, the content from, from back when you used to do the show, um, and, you know, all of your talks that are online that people can access, like, you you have this effect in in people's home all the time and it's it's millions upon millions of people who have been affected by your work and and that's got to be satisfying for you well i must tell you of a 
of an event that happened to me, oh, many years ago, many, many years ago. Uh, I was going to say when I was young, but <laughs> it, couldn't, it couldn't be that far back. Uh, <laughs> but I was, um, I was doing the lecture circuit, traveling out of New York mostly, and uh, I was doing very well with it. And uh, Harry Blackstone, Harry Blackstone, the great Blackstone, the Blackstone, um, Harry Blackstone lived at the Royalton Hotel. Now, that's a residential hotel, or was in those days, a residential hotel um, in, in the heart of Manhattan. And uh, he had chosen to live there with his wife. And uh, he, um, well, strangely enough, uh, his wife um, didn't share his philosophy at all. She uh, used to get up very early in the morning and looking a little bit tatty, perhaps, and she'd head out of the house. And if I was visiting Harry at that time, and I, I might be, because I, I lived in Manhattan at that time, and um, she would, he would look at me and say, oh, she's off. And she would come back a bit later, sort of from a, from a different angle in the in the apartment and uh, go to the bedroom right here, the door click shut, and we wouldn't see her for the rest of the day. We'd go out for lunch and we'd meet some of the our fellow magicians in, in various uh, parts of Manhattan, and we'd have a, a great time, but we'd forgotten about her altogether. She was a believer in, in certain things that uh, we found it hard to to accept, and uh, I won't get into all the details of it, but um, Harry would give a great sigh, and he would say to me uh, something like, here she goes again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and, and this, this uh, she was not a bad person, not at all, but she just didn't understand, and she certainly didn't share any of our, our philosophy about uh, tricks and trickery and deception of the public. But uh, I must tell you that uh, they moved away, uh, the Blackstones themselves, they moved away uh, to Hollywood. And uh, they, they lived uh, for quite some, some time in Hollywood. And I understand he was a great attraction at the Magic Castle, as you might imagine. And... Uh, I was just so disappointed to see Harry disappointed that she couldn't share his philosophy. Right. And, and that that, uh, that hurt me, and I, I'm sure it hurt him, but he smiled a lot. And um, he, he was, in his retirement, he, he was a different person altogether. Um, he didn't have the obligations to... Uh, carry on as a magician he didn't need to at all and uh, he had certainly certainly a few wealthy supporters who voluntarily uh, gave him uh, uh, enough an, enough cash to carry on right and uh, without having to worry about where his next meal was coming from yeah but uh, he said to me one day, we were sitting down. I remember the air conditioning, for some reason, had failed this particular day. So we were out on the balcony. And he leaned forward in his chair. And he said something to me, Travis, that I will never forget. I'll never forget the event and, and what happened following it. He said to me, one of these days, he said, uh, now you're well-established in magic now, speaking to me. And uh, he said, uh, I know you think you've been through everything, but one of these days you're going to beat an audience. And I looked at him, unknowing what he was talking about. I, <laughs> I was used to coming out ahead in a discussion. But um, he said to me, oh, don't look at me that way. And I'm sure it was a, a strange way which I did rear at him at that point. And uh, he said, one of these days you'll, you'll work before an audience that is so 
inimicable. It, 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 you just can't handle them. You can't uh, can't conquer them. You can't quite beat them. He said, uh, in, that, in that case, just see it through, but speak in a low voice. Now, that is one thing that stayed with me. And uh, I, I found out that that worked very well because not more than a week after that, I was out on a club date at a high school, and I was told by the manager of the high school, he said, I don't worry if the audience doesn't pay much attention to you. Uh, they don't like magicians. <laughs> and they, they, they told me a long time. Now, that, that's not too unlikely uh, an occasion. Uh, but they don't like magicians, and they they will boo, and they will hiss, and they will carry on. And... Um, I thought, okay, maybe I'll, I'll use something that, that can, can beat that situation. And so I, when I walked out on stage, and uh, you get the usual hisses and boos and whatnot, and go home and this kind of thing. Yep. And I just spoke in a low voice. Not this low, but low enough that they had a hard time hearing me. <laughs> and they, some people in the audience say, shh, shh, shh. He just said so and so. I got them quietened down, and then I said to them, in, in a perfectly ordinary voice, I had a microphone with me, yeah. but in a perfectly ordinary microphone voice, I said, Now, when I first came out here, you made a terrible noise. You were, you were noisy and boisterous, and you didn't want to hear what I had to say at all, but uh, I got something to show you here. Now, there was one number in my in my act that I, I still remember with a great fondness and it uh, involved a, a reader's digest or a, another magazine of that kind and I would give it to uh, quietly at one side of the of the room while the audience is coming in I'd give it to one usually young lady uh, and I'd ask her to go over in the corner and uh, simply select a word there and remember that word and she had remembered it, and uh, she'd say, okay. She shouted at me, and I'd go back over there and say, don't show it to me now. Just tear that page out of the book and fold it up and put it in your purse. She said, oh, okay. And I said, I will try to tell you that word later on. And she said, oh, that's impossible, And uh, <laughs> which I like to hear, too. <laughs> and um, so later on in the, in the show... I would say, there's a young lady I spoke to in the audience here. Where, oh, there you are. Stand up, would you please? And then I, I would go through a routine, and I would end up having a, a big drawing on a big, big pad. I'd have them get me a big, big drawing pad. And uh, it didn't make any sense. It had lines going backwards and forwards all over it. And I'd say, this doesn't seem to make much sense. I'm trying to tell the young lady the word that she was thinking of. Ah, oh, wait a minute. And I would go down to the lower corner and tear up the whole sheet and show it to the audience. And they would see that I had actually gotten the word, but I got it backwards, written backwards completely and upside down. And there would be a pause and the, whoa, <laughs> that you see would win any audience, yeah. and uh, it did for years. But when I did it this particular time, they actually came up and sat me on their shoulders. A big football player uh, decided to put me on his shoulders, and he, he marched around the stage with me, and I couldn't do the rest of the show. And I, I went back to my dressing room, and I sat down, and I said... Uh, to my reflection in the mirror, well, that that I, I made something out of that, though it, it started out badly, and then it suddenly it occurred to me, that's what Harry Blackstone was trying to tell me at the Royalton Hotel. Huh. That's what he was trying to tell me, that I would have those. And I went right back to New York, and I was due to go back anyway, the next day, and I, I bust in on him. <laughs> early in the morning, and he was just going out to breakfast. 
and I told him the whole story. <laughs> and uh, he grinned. I think they broke his face. Yeah. He, he just grinned from ear to ear, and he said, "Yeah, sure. I, I told you, didn't I?" And uh, but he he was smiling all the way through it, and uh, that was a great satisfaction to me. And I never forgot that experience with Harry Blackstone. Wow, that's um, that's amazing. Like uh, some of those moments that uh, that get you, you just never forget, and and we have them that's from. Right childhood and then i'm sure you've had so many in your life like that oh yeah well this one was particularly uh important to me because uh, harry had told me about this and uh, he, he died not long after that um and i always had a, a great memory i have a picture of him on, on my wall right here hmm. in my home as a matter of fact harry blackstone what a magical name <laughs> what a um, so, speaking of, speaking of uh, of you know people people passing on, people dying. Uh, what's what's the thing you'll miss most about living on Earth? <laughs> well, I don't know whether I'm going someplace else. Yeah, but I I rather doubt that. I think that's a bit of a myth. But we won't get into that. I I think to save our our souls from. Damnation, something like that. Uh, I, um, I, I don't know. I, uh, I'm very satisfied with the life I've lived. Not totally, no, not, not totally. I, I made some boo boos along the way, and I had to pay for them, uh, in in one way or another, uh, with inconvenience and uh, uh, loss of reputation and a few things like that. But uh, I've kept my head pretty well together, and um, I think that when I when I close my eyes for the last time, I, I'm not trying to encourage that, but, <laughs> but I think that when I do, I'll probably be smiling. And uh, if you come upon me at that point, uh, make sure that you curl my lips up a little bit. Okay? I I, I guarantee you. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's, that's amazing to hear. I mean, that's something, you know, when my, t my time comes, I, I'll want to be able to look back on my life and smile for sure. That's. Yeah. Yeah. We can do that. I think we've, we've had a, had, had a winner. Yeah. Um, let's finish with this, this question. Uh, what would, what would be the most important piece of knowledge that you could give to future generations? Well, it depends on what kind of an audience I, I was speaking to. If I was speaking to magicians, it would be one thing. If I was just speaking to a lay audience, it would, it would be another. But um, to magicians, I, I would say, uh, uh, always stay true to yourself. Tell them what you really think. And if it's, if it's not what I really think, I don't mind all that much because uh, I'm satisfied that I've got, I've got the right answer. Uh, but I, I would ask you to, to work on it a little bit. And uh, if, you're, mm, if you're talking to a lay audience, uh, you have them in a theater in most cases. And uh, it's astonishing, but I, I must tell you this too. This is something which I'm having a little more um, often now. Um, I'll have people who will come up to the front edge of the stage, as I, as I said previously, up to the front edge of the stage, and they really want to, <laughs> to, to embrace me and kiss me and the whole thing, and I, I'm not for all that goo goo stuff. <laughs> Got to be careful. Yeah. Uh, because I, I'm such an attractive person that they, <laughs> they can't resist it. Um, but when I meet those people, I I often follow them down the aisle and buttonhole them in the lobby and maybe take them out for a cup of coffee or something like that. And uh, 
have a bit more of a chat with them. And those chats are often so rewarding, Travis, I can't tell you. Um, now that's what makes up my life from now, now on. I think I'm going to shape her out this way, and uh, I, I think it's a, it's a life well lived. I have no complaints about it. It wasn't perfect, as I said, uh, not at all, but uh, it was as close to perfect, I think, as I could ever get it. And uh, speaking of close to perfect, uh, when are we going to get together again? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we need to we need to do something. I I want to, you know, do something close to your place so you don't have to do a lot of traveling. Um, but mm-hmm. maybe maybe we could do something in New York or something uh, along those lines uh, soon. But I we got to do something. And I know there's so many uh, young people that want want an opportunity to chat with you and talk to you. So I think we need to. Uh, we need to set some stuff up for sure if you're available and willing. Oh, I'm willing. <laughs> uh, I'll only be available if I'm dead. I, not available <laughs> if I'm dead. <laughs> I've got that wrong. Yeah. Uh, I've got to have a little more discipline in my, in my speech here. But uh, it, it's been a pleasure hearing your voice again, Travis. Yes. And um, I remember that we, we, did, we did some good work. Yes. Yeah, that was fun, and um, I hope to repeat that. So yes. Let's, let's work to that end. Yes, we? for sure. We, let's do it. And uh, everyone, this has been the amazing James Randi. And James, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. A great pleasure. And uh, the screen here it might be broken because I haven't been able to see you. But uh, <laughs> no, I guess not. No, <laughs> I, I'm on a computer here with a screen. Uh, I don't see myself at all, and I don't see you, but uh, we'll do what we can, okay? All right. Well, thanks, James. And everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Today, I'm speaking with God Saad. He is a popular blogger for Psychology Today and a professor of marketing at the John Molson School of Business at Concordia University. He holds the Concordia University Research Chair in Evolutionary Behavioral Sciences and Darwinian Consumption and is the author of The Evolutionary Basis of Consumption, plus numerous scientific papers. He's the godfather. Thanks for taking the time today, God. Oh, sure. Thanks for inviting me. So what's new? What's new in the world of God? What's keeping you busy? (laughs) Well, uh, other than my, of course, professorial duties, which includes hosting, organizing and hosting a symposium tomorrow on evolutionary consumption, which I can talk about a bit if you'd like in a second. That'd be great. I'm also still fighting all the lunacy in academia, but maybe if you'd like, I could start with the symposium and then we could move on to the lunacy. Definitely go right ahead. So for, for, for the listeners who may not know what is meant by evolutionary consumption, it's basically the idea that to fully understand human behavior in general, and consumer behavior in particular, you have to look at the evolutionary forces that have shaped our minds and bodies. So we don't suddenly uh, throw our biology out the window when we put on our consumer hat. And so uh, more than 20 years ago, I founded and developed the field of evolutionary consumption. And I'm happy to report now that there is a greater number of folks who are working at that intersection. And so I thought I would invite some of the uh, you know, a few of the leading evolutionary behavioral scientists and if, and some more junior folks to give talks uh, in, a, in a one day symposium. And so I'm really looking forward to hosting them tomorrow. Right. And, uh, and, w- w- and this is in Montreal, correct? This is in Montreal. It's uh, at the John Molson School of Business. Uh, if anybody is listening to this uh, and, it, and, and is able to act on this uh, by tomorrow, it starts at 10 o'clock and it goes on until five. There are seven speakers. Uh, it'll be really so lots of fun and very educational. I hope. Yeah, I hope uh, people go out and uh, check this out for sure. Um, okay, let's uh, let's start in with maybe some uh, current affairs of what's going on. Speaking of behavior, um, what what do you make of this Brett Kavanaugh situation? <laughs> I knew that that's what we would lead in with. Yeah. Uh, well, I've actually uh, produced and uploaded, I think, at least five or six uh, clips on my channel, The Sad Truth, uh, on this issue. I think it's absolute insanity. Uh, and let me explain why. 
it, it seems to me incredible that uh, you can have an exact repeat of the Salem witch hunt in the 21st century. I don't know if Brett Kavanaugh is guilty or not. No one knows other than perhaps him and uh, the accuser. Uh, what we do know is that someone came at the last second, 36 years after the fact, and said, I think that something happened somewhere at some point, at some place, and I need to be believed. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that she shouldn't be uh, heard, and I think certainly people have granted her all the courtesy to be heard, but the incredible response that I've seen from my, quote, progressive liberal friends, literally should cause people to have goosebumps running up and down their bodies, because today it's Brett Kavanaugh, tomorrow it's Travis Pangburn, or his son, <laughs> yeah. or his uncle, or his grandfather. Right. Uh, I left the Middle East, uh, thankfully, and I came to a country where there are certain indelible freedoms that most of the rest of the world has not always necessarily had. What makes the United States, Canada, and the West in general wonderful among many attributes is that we do have due process, we do have the presumption of innocence, and to see sophisticated thinkers, many of whom you've interacted with, many of whom you've organized events for, completely lose their minds because, you know, he must be guilty because he is somehow associated with the Republicans is insane. And I think people ultimately listen to my position other than because it is very rational. I think it's because I'm Canadian. And so I come across to people as not having a dog in the fight, which right. is exactly true, right? I mean, I don't care one way or the other. I'm looking at it as an impartial observer north of the border, and it makes my skin crawl because uh, it seems astounding that this process can be happening. Right. So what, one thing I've heard, uh, uh, Sam Harris came out with this recently. I think he, he kind of, in his housekeeping part of his recent uh, podcast, he mentioned that uh, he... You know, if you're if you're hiring, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, but if you're hiring for a job, and there's all this noise behind this person that uh, that's you know in line for this job, why not just skip on to the next applicant and uh, and and then you don't have to deal with all this noise? Do you think that's just just kind of bending over essentially to to anyone that could come in and, and make a false a allegation? Of course, yeah. it's insane that he would say this, right? I mean. I mean, so what that you've done a scorched, scorched earth policy on this guy and, you know, ruined his reputation, you know, probably destroyed the emotional stability of his children and his wife. Hey, let's just move on to another guy. And if he had to be, you know, the casualty of this great cultural war, so be it. It's insane. Right. I mean, I, I satirized many things about this case, uh, one of which was, hey, why don't we from now on, whenever someone applies for a professorship, we send out a press release stating that he, is a, he or she is a serial, uh, sadistic, pedophile rapist. Right. And then we will watch how this candidate responds. If the candidate responds in an indignant and angry manner, well, cr clearly, bruh, he must not have or she must not have the emotional uh, stability to be a professor. I mean, it's insane. It's the Salem witch hunt. Right. Yeah. I'm, uh, I, you know, it's like if, if you're sitting up uh, be, and being accused of something and, and you, you, you're, you're being defensive and, and defending your character, is that not just a natural response? I mean, it's the most natural response. I mean, uh, many of us uh, were amazed that he was this restraint right? I mean, th this speaks to, by the way, uh, you know, let's incorporate some psychological analyses here. There is a phenomenon in psychology known as the fundamental attribution error. The fundamental attribution error is the notion that we often attribute, uh, say we see a phenomenon taking place, we attribute it dispositionally to the person rather than this, to the situation at hand, right? Uh, and that's a Big problem because, so let me give you an example. Uh, the way that I respond when I'm tucking my children to bed in a warm, affectionate, loving manner 
is very different than the way that I respond if I am accosted, about to be mugged by three young guys in an alley. In the latter case, I might act very violently in defending myself. No one would come to me if they are not naturally lobotomized and say, but hey, professor, you exhibited great violence in that alley. That must mean somehow that you are emotionally unstable. That would be an example of succumbing to the fundamental attribution error. You're attributing something to me dispositionally when it was only the situation at hand that was forcing me to be violent. So here is a guy who's been accused, and, and again, I'm not suggesting that he is guilty or not guilty, but we do have the presumption of innocence for a reason. And the evidence that has been, that has been offered in support of the accuser, it, nearly every single lawyer that I've heard speak on the matter said that it wouldn't pass the door of their office, right? Right. So he responds in an indignant manner. You presume that that's because dispositionally he's a violent, aggressive guy. You don't understand that he's fighting for his life, for his reputation. I mean, it's insane. Yeah, there seems to be a depersonalization or like a, a demonization here of of him, and and there's there's a a lack of ability of some you know liberals um, to to see him as a person, and and they're getting it seems like triggered by these these basic outbursts of emotion that he's having when trying to defend you know his, himself in front of his family and friends and yeah. everyone well what amazes me is that many of the folks that you and I know the supposed intelligentsia will be the first to criticize uh, you know the dogmatism of religion so many of the folks that you can probably list right now uh, you mentioned one a few minutes ago has has become very famous around the world for uh, critiquing religion because in 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 having a religious mindset you are ultimately being dogmatic you're not adhering to rules of logic and reason and science and evidence based thinking so the exact same people who've made their career and reputation on defending these ideals of reason these paragons of rationality suddenly become the most fundamental, uh, quote, quasi-religious extremists when it's their pet ideology that's being attacked, right? So, for example, the Trump hysteria is absolutely insane. Now, again, I say this as a Canadian. I appeared on Sam Harris's show two years ago where I offered a very clear, very sober explanation of the types of decision rules that perfectly rational people might have used in choosing Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton. And none of those rules required that the people who chose Trump be maniacs and Nazis and yeah. two KKK members who sleep with their sisters, right? Yeah. Uh, and yet these supposed rational people are simply incapable of conceding the fact that there might be very clear reasons why people could have preferred Trump over Hillary Clinton, despite the fact that Trump is full of flaws. Yes. No, you can't concede that. There's going to be a nuclear holocaust. We're going to lose democracy. Trump is going to outlaw sex, and we're all doomed in the next 20 minutes. It's insane. It's embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, embarrassing is the best stamp to put on this Kavanaugh thing, and I would, I would probably say it, at least uh, the way Trump is displaying himself i mean it, it seems like the guy's brain is rotting but i don't think this is going to end in a holocaust a holocaust or any kind of uh um well democracy is going to be end and uh, democracy is going to end he's going to declare martial law uh this is the the incoming of a, a new dictatorship uh while well, we had democracy it was a good run i mean really do you truly believe that this little bleep called Donald Trump in the great history of the United States is going to marshal all of these unbelievably dire consequences. I mean, what kind of hysteric must you be to actually believe these things? But this is what happens when ostrich parasitic syndrome, as I will explain in my next book, uh, infects even otherwise brilliant minds. Right. Um, let's move on to uh, some stuff on consuming. I I just had this question uh, just when I was 
looking through some of your work, why are some of us more driven to consume at a higher rate than others? Well, it depends what you mean at a higher rate. I mean, it, uh, you know, I may consume more burgers than you, but you may consume more pornography than me, right? So, so I don't think there is sort of a. I'm a sure general... I do consume more porn than you. <laughs> <laughs> I did not mean that in any way. Inside knowledge, it was a complete hypothetical example. Uh, uh, and, and by the way, I consume a lot less hamburgers than I did, having lost over the past year nearly 30 pounds. So I'm very proud of that. Oh, very uh, good. Another another twenty, and I think I will have to register as a dangerous weapon. <laughs> but in any case, uh, I, I don't I don't think one can make the statement that uh, I mean there is, for example, something called compulsive buying, uh, which uh, in a sense might indirectly speak to what you're asking. So compulsive buying is a psychiatric disorder. And so it's not you know you're not a compulsive buyer if you if you buy you know five pairs of running shoes. Compulsive buying requires that it truly becomes a dysfunction, right? You you become financially destitute. Your marriage is ruined because of your shopping sprees. Uh, well, it turns out that 90% of compulsive buyers are women. And the thing, the, the, the items that they compulsively hoard, if you like, are very much related to beautification. Uh, so it's not as though they they just hoard any possible product. It's not some women hoard lawnmowers, other women hoard cameras, and other women hoard lipsticks. It, so the way that I explain it using my evolutionary framework is that many of the maladaptive behaviors that we engage in, right, pathological gambling, pornographic addiction, eating disorders, compulsive buying, are maladaptive manifestations of otherwise adaptive processes. So that women wish to beautify themselves in the mating market makes perfect adaptive sense. When that mechanism becomes hyperactive, right, it, it, it is triggered too many times, it becomes maladaptive. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. And so I actually, in, in, in several, in, in, in two of my books, I discuss what I call the Darwinian roots uh, of dark side consumption. And so for example, when it comes to uh, pornographic addictions, nearly all porn addicts are male. And this is not specific to the United States or to Tanzania. Anywhere around the world where you have porn addicts, it is much more likely to be men who suffer from that particular condition. Uh, when it comes to pathological gambling, it's overwhelmingly men who suffer from it. When it comes to eating disorders, it's almost exclusively women who suffer from it. So the fact that there is a sex specificity to the manner by which these disorders manifest themselves, and the fact that it happens in a universal manner across time and place suggests that there is a Darwinian etiology. Right. But ultimately, aren't we just at the mercy of our pleasure drives? So we're, you know, we're, we're, we're just driven to consume. And, and I guess what I mean by that is um, I feel like I'm a pleasure junkie because I can't go to the same uh bagel shop every morning have the same coffee like i can't get into a routine like that and find pleasure in it i'm always searching for like i feel like i'm a pleasure junkie but some people are are able to be satisfied with uh you know with going to the same shop every morning so uh it doesn't that come into play here yeah, that, that's a great question. So there is a, uh, uh, a psychometric scale, if you'd like, known as the variety seeking scale, which exactly speaks to what you just described, right? Some of us would be perfectly happy to go back to the same restaurant and reorder the same favorite dish, whereas others would become quickly overcome with tedium or boredom. And they need to, as you, as you described yourself, to try something different. Now, it turns out, since you mentioned pleasure seeking, well, how people score on variety seeking is correlated to another personality trait known as the sensation seeking scale. So some of us have a higher threshold in terms of the level of sensation seeking that we aspire to experience in our daily lives. And so these two constructs, if you like, are highly correlated. So I suspect that if I were to administer to you both of these scales, you would score on the higher end of both. You are a variety seeker and you are a sensation seeker. Hmm. Interesting. Um, where do you where do you stand on the evolution of religiosity 
in the mind is this is this a mind virus as um as dawkins might describe it or uh what, what where do you sit on that right uh, be before i answer that that question i just produced a uh, clip uh, on you know my channel uh where i uh regrettably uh, had to criticize i say regrettably because uh there are many wonderful things that i admire about richard dawkins uh how he's popularized evolutionary theory, how he's been such an important public figure coming out of academia. But he recently endorsed a hallucinatorily idiotic article by Paul Krugman, the quote Nobel Prize winner from 2008 in economics, where Paul Krugman was basically saying that the whole, you know, the reason why Brett Kavanaugh was acting the way that he was and the, the reason why Trump is the way that he is and why people voted for Trump is because of this collective white male resentment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, white males are realizing that they're losing power and so they lash out. So it's not, so Brett Kavanaugh was not angry and indignant because he's been accused of being a gang rapist walking up and down the East Coast, raping everybody in sight. That's not the reason why he was indignant. He was indignant because, you know, Barack Obama was president last and that really upset him. So I thought that was such an affront to reason to human dignity that I went after this buffoon and what upset me I say this buffoon meaning Paul Krugman right. what upset me about Richard Dawkins is that he actually retweeted it hmm. you know with an endorsement like bullseye what a great article by Paul Krugman so two white men are arguing that the problems that we are seeing is due to you know white men it's insane yeah. but anyways to come back to your question uh, so Evolutionists have actually offered several competing explanations for why religion exists. So one, one explanation is that religion is an adaptation, meaning that religion itself confers survival advantage to those who are religious. And so the classic um, supporter of that viewpoint is a good friend of mine, the evolutionary biologist uh, David Sloan Wilson, who argued using it, what's called group selectionism, who argued that groups that are religious, by, by the sheer nature of being religious, have greater communality, greater cohesion, greater likelihood of uh, investing in one another and engaging in reciprocal uh, arrangements, uh, greater demarcation between the in-group and the out-group. And by virtue of the fact that religion promotes all of these things, then a religious group is more likely to out-survive a non-religious group. So that argument argues that religion itself serves as an adaptation. The second completely different perspective, but also evolutionary, is that religion is an exaptation. An exaptation means it's a byproduct of evolution. It, it, it didn't specifically evolve for that purpose, but religion piggybacks on computational systems in our brains that existed for a different purpose. So for example, the fact that we have what's called agency detection in our brain, well, religion piggybacks on that. The, right. fact, the fact that we are uh, prone to coalitional thinking, us versus them, red team versus blue team, well, here comes religion, certainly Abrahamic religions, that offer exactly that narrative. If I'm Jewish, there are the Jews and the Goys. If I am uh, Muslim, there are the believers and the Kuffar. If, if I am Christian, there are those who accept Jesus in their heart and the rest of us who are going to hell. So there are very clear red team, blue team uh, demarcations. And so from that perspective, if you like that mind virus example that you gave, so that's a different uh, lens to use to understand religion. A third way to study religion is to actually look at the contents of religious dogma and to show that it really speaks to it being made by man. So for example, Laura Betzig, a Darwinian historian, uh, did a content analysis of the Old Testament and she showed that uh, male protagonists in the, in the Old Testament uh, have more or less women as a function of their social status. So if you are a prophet, if you are a, a, a king, if you are a general, you will have more women than if you are a farmer and a certainly a slave and so on, which of course speaks to the fact that 
uh, reproductive fitness of men increases drastically if they increase their social status. So there are different ways to study religion. I mean, my personal view is that I probably think between the adaptation versus exaptation, I'm more in the exaptation camp. I don't think that, uh, you know, we, we needed religion to have evolved, but religion certainly piggybacks on computational systems in our brain. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I, I, I often uh, put religion in the art category, and somehow um, it kind of made its way into myth uh, that made its way into kind of infecting um, what we actually believed is really going on in reality. And uh, right. and you know, I would I would hope that, uh, and I think we are moving towards. Um, uh, you know what the what the Greek gods have become. Uh, they've become great myths and and great art that we can derive. You know, films from and and music and and different things. Yeah, and and actually to to build on what you just said. So in in, in a lot of my work, I talk about cultural products as fossils of the human mind. Hmm. And so let me, let me explain what I mean by that. So if 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 you're a paleontologist wanting to study the evolutionary history of a long extinct species, you know, some dinosaur species that's been gone for 65 plus million years. Well, my currency really is to identify skeletal remains, look for fossils that allow me to ultimately infer all sorts of things about the evolutionary history of that species. Well, the human mind is organic, so it doesn't fossilize. But what I argue does fossilize are the cultural products that human minds leave behind, right? And so you mentioned art, you mentioned literature, uh, we mentioned religion. Well, let me add a few song lyrics, movie plot lines, television plot lines. So everything that titillates our senses, we could study their content to tell us something really profound about human nature. So the reason why you and I can, since you mentioned Greek gods, why you and I can uh, read a ancient Greek you know, poem from, from antiquity and fully understand what this guy was saying, it's because despite the fact that we are separated by a couple of thousand years and he doesn't know how to use a smartphone or doesn't know what a plane is, the software that his brain is running on is identical yeah. to the one that is running yours and mine. So therefore, I could I could do a content analysis. I could look for fossils, basically cultural products across cultures, across time, and I could demonstrate that there are certain human universals, certain universal themes that keep propping, propping up in exactly the same way. So for example, when it comes to song lyrics, there are some profoundly you know, similar things across song lyrics. So I could take troubadours from 800 years ago and show that the things that they sang about is exactly the same as what hip hop artists sing about today. Their style is different, the directness of their language is different, how much profanity they use is different, but there is no culture, for example, where a male is singing to a female and saying, uh, hey Linda, you're not being very ambitious in your work, no sex for you, right? But the opposite, I could show you a million songs where women denigrate men for not having social status and therefore there's going to be no loving, right? So uh, the things that men and women sing about in songs is a wonderful window to our human nature. Yeah, that's really interesting. It, it just brings up uh, Shakespeare in my mind and, and, how, and how he created so many uh, interesting concepts and, and, and some of it on piggybacking on what, what he read and, uh, things he discovered. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think even he, uh, used some fossils from the past and, and, uh, formed some new ones from that inspiration. Exactly. And, 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 and just to, again, build on what we're saying, uh, the reason why Shakespeare is Shakespeare is, is precisely because he's, he understands human nature really well, right? Is because, Yes, I mean, he is couching it in a particular dramatic, you know, literary form. But the reason why it, it hits us and has hit us for 500 years and we get it is because he is speaking about things that make perfect sense to you and I today. Well, uh, 
that speaks to, for example, in marketing. So when I try to apply these ideas, when I explain how these ideas would apply to consumer behavior and marketing, say to my students, I tell them, look, a good marketer is ultimately one who understands human nature well, right? Uh, if you create products that are antithetical to human nature, they're not going to work. So, and the classic example I like to give of, of that is romance novels, since we were talking earlier about literature. I mean, if we can call romance novels literature. <laughs> Although maybe some female viewers will not be happy at my saying this because they're very vested in that genre. But anyways, uh, romance novels are almost exclusively read by women around the world. So it's not as though this is a phenomenon that holds true in the U.S., but in Bolivia, it's more men who read it. So anywhere where romance novels exist, it is almost exclusively women who read them. Well, if I want to understand, for example, uh, what is the you know, ideal uh, archetype of a male in, in women's fantasies, well, I just look to romance novels because those who are writing those romance novels have to write stories that are going to titillate the female mind since it is the female consumer who's going to consume that particular product. And therefore, if I want to understand what is that ideal archetype, uh, and by the way, I'm not using archetype here in the mumbo jumbo Jungian BS sense, right? There, I mean archetype in the sense that there is a a particular schema that comes through our evolved mating preferences that make men desire certain attributes in women and make women desire certain attributes in men. Well, the typical archetype of the male hero in a romance novel is he's tall, he's a neurosurgeon and a prince. He wrestles alligators on his six pack. Uh, is reckless and a risk taker and a tiger who could only be tamed by the love of this one good woman. I just explained to you every single romance novel that's ever been written. Right. Well, a company came out uh, some years ago. This is uh, an anecdote that I had heard, so I don't, I don't, I don't have the exact uh, reference of which company it was. But I think it doesn't. It no longer exists, and you'll see in a second why. And they wanted to break the shackles of this uh, toxic masculinity. Although I don't think they had used that term; it wasn't available then. And so they wanted to come up with a new uh, definition of masculinity. They wanted to teach consumers what they should prefer in an idealized man. And so the man should be watching Bridget Jones' diary while sucking his thumb and crying because his girlfriend left him because he's sensitive, right? Right. Guess what happened to that romance novel line? Uh, probably didn't even sell a copy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so now where, 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 what was the error here? It comes from actually a fundamental violation of evolutionary psychology, which is the blank slate premise of the human mind, tabula rasa. It, tabula rasa basically says we're all born with empty slates, and ultimately anything that we exhibit, our preferences, our desires, our choices, our actions, our feelings, are all due to some socialization process. It could be advertising, it could be our rabbi, it could be our friends, it could be our parents, but we're born with empty slates. And therefore, if we're born with empty slates, I, as the uh, marketer, should be able to shape you into any trajectory that I want. Well, that's idiotic. No, of course socialization matters, but there are some biological blueprints that we come into the world with, one of which is that women are not very excited about fantasizing about pear-shaped guys who have nasal voices. Yeah. That's the bottom line. So a good marketer is one that offers products within the constraints of our human nature. Hmm. God damn, this is good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's interesting about the uh, the novel. I, I'm sure there's many loud voices out there that say, well, not, you know, not all women are going to not want to read that novel, but I think the <laughs> the statistics on that would be very overwhelming. And, 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 then, and then the thing comes down to it's like, how do we know when someone is just virtue signaling and buying something because they want to show that this this is, you know, an attractive story to some women and how do we know that that it's being done for that reason and not for the reason of you know actually wanting to read this content sure. actually it's interesting that you mentioned the word virtue signaling one of the speakers at tomorrow's uh, 
symposium that I'm hosting is uh, Jeffrey Miller, uh, a well-known evolution psychologist, and his lecture is going to be on uh, virtue signaling of both consumers and companies. So it, it's exactly uh, in line with what you're saying. But to go to your point about the not all, right, not all women uh, would want, uh, or hashtag not all, uh, this is actually one of the most common uh, uh, points that are raised by supposed detractors of evolutionary psychology. It's, it's, it's just, uh, I'm trying to be nice here and as charitable as I can, but it is some of the most idiotic manifestations that one could imagine coming out of a mouth. So here's how it works. So if I walk into a lecture and say, well, Homo sapiens are a sexually dimorphic species, meaning that there are evolved sex differences between men and women. And here's an example. Size is a sexually dimorphic attribute in Homo sapiens, meaning that we are not equal size. For example, some penguin species are not sexually dimorphic. The males and the females are exactly the same size. Humans, males, are bigger than females. Uh, that is a fact that is as clear as the existence of gravity. Well, guess what some brilliant Einstein will raise their hand in the audience and say, Travis. Yeah. But, Professor, that doesn't make sense because my Aunt Linda is bigger <laughs> than my Uncle Joe. Oh, Darwin is dead. Back to the drawing board, evolutionists. We're dead. Yeah. The fam is gone. Okay? So if I say, on average, men prefer to mate with uh, fertile women, nubile women, rather than postmenopausal women. But, Professor, my nephew, uh, John is dating uh, Linda the Cougar, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> I think that because a statement that holds true at the population level and that is incontestable at the population level, they think that that's violated by a single datum. So that's insane, right? Every single WNBA player, so women who play in the women's NBA, yeah. is taller and bigger than nearly every single man who's ever existed. Yeah. Yet that doesn't invalidate the statement that men are bigger than women. And so through all of my work in evolutionary psychology for the past two plus decades, I've cataloged a bunch of these cognitive and emotional biases. In other words, in my quest to try to infuse evolutionary psychology, in my case within the business school, I've come up across many of these forms of distorted thinking to and 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 it's really important that I try to understand them because if I if I want to convince you about the merits of evolutionary psychology and understanding human behavior I have to understand why you're building these obstacles what is it that's causing you to not accept all of the evidence in support of evolution in support of the fact that the human mind is the product of evolutionary processes and so if you'd like, I can maybe discuss one or two others of these types of traps. Is, is that yes. Right? yes, definitely. So here's another one. Uh, and again, in, in, in one of my books, I, I offer you know a, f a whole list of these. Uh, and it, it wasn't even a full list. Uh, I, I, I got too upset after listing the first nine, I think. Uh, so uh, here's one. Evolutionary psychologists explain the full panoply of the human condition. In other words... They, can, they explain both uh, romantic love and sibling love and parent-offspring love and altruism and compassion and kindness. All of these things are an indelible part of our humanity, and therefore, we explain them. We seek to understand the evolutionary roots of all of these realities. But we also recognize that humans can be bad. Humans engage in child abuse. Humans rape. Humans go to war. Humans cheat on their monogamous unions. Therefore, whenever an evolutionary psychologist offers a scientific explanation for those negative manifestations of human behavior, some person will then accuse the evolutionary psychologist of condoning those behaviors, right. of justifying them. Now, this is so breathtakingly idiotic that it really behooves one to understand how could a, and, and by the way, these are levied oftentimes by academics, right? Uh, and the analogy that I usually use, which makes these people, you know, go away, is I say, yeah, that's great thinking, Einstein. So a oncologist who studies liver cancer is 
pro-cancer, <laughs> it's for cancer, yeah. it's trying to justify and condone cancer, and that usually makes them go away. Yeah, and Jordan Peterson comes under fire for this all the time, like if he states something like, you know, uh, agreeableness in women is much higher than men. He'll make exactly. a state. He'll make a statement that you know uh, uh, women are more agreeable than than men, and uh, and then this this people then go to say, oh well, he's saying that uh, he's happy that women are less or, or more agreeable than men, but that's not what he's saying at all. Exactly. It's it. It really. It, I I think it ultimately though comes from an ideological repulsion to evolution in general, but certainly evolutionary psychology. Uh, most of the detractors of evolutionary psychology are ultimately driven by the fact that they sense that evolutionary psychology is a direct frontal attack on their pet ideology. You follow what I'm saying? Yep. It, it, the, the, the scientific, the quote scientific criticism of evolutionary psychology uh, in most instances, is utter garbage. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, evolutionary psychology or any other discipline is not worthy of scientific scrutiny. But to say that evolutionary psychology is BS is equivalent to saying that chemistry is BS, right? It, it's an idiotic statement that carries literally no meaning. The human mind either came from God or through some other mysterious agent, or it could have only come from the exact same process that explains the evolution of every single other living thing on Earth. Well, the people who don't like evolutionary psychology are oftentimes perfectly happy to accept that evolution explains the behavior of the salamander and the zebra and the mosquito. But don't you dare say that evolution explains the behavior of humans. That's what makes us humans. We transcend our biology. We transcend our instincts. We are a cultural animal. Uh, no, you're not. Of course we are cultural animals, but we are also biological animals. Uh, to be human doesn't mean that you exist in a universe where your biology ceases to matter, right? Uh, now there are other people who are even more paradoxical in their idiocy. They will be evolutionary biologists who accept perfectly evolution, who accept evolution to explain everything in us, except our mind, okay? So uh, if you use evolution to explain how our pancreas has evolved to be of its form, that's perfectly fine. If you use evolution to explain why we have opposable thumbs, that's perfectly fine. But Dr. Saad, surely you can't be such a moron as to think that the organ above your neck that defines our personhood, namely our brain, is due to evolution. Surely you can't be such a Nazi. Well, where do you think that the brain comes from? I mean, evolution explains our liver, our kidneys, our pancreas, our opposable thumbs, but it's another process that explains our mind, right? So again, it all comes ultimately from a revulsion of what they consider are the ideological implications of, e of evolution psychology. But there are no ideological implications of evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychology is nothing more than the application of evolutionary principles to explain the most important organ that defines our personhood, and that's called the human mind. It's as simple as that. So some evolutionists are conservative, some are libertarian, some are liberal, some are God-fearing, some are atheists. We have no vested interest in an ideology. We simply use the tools of the greatest idea that's ever been uncovered called evolution to explain our personhood. Simple as that. Yeah. And the moral of this story is be less triggered by facts. <laughs> well, that's, by the way, something that I'll be discussing quite a bit in my next book. Uh, maybe we can, you, you want me to talk a bit about that? Um, yeah, what, uh, what, what, are you, uh, what are you working on right now? For... So, so my next book I'm talking about, uh, uh, so uh, the, the tentative title right now is The Parasitic Mind. And so what I do in, in the book is I start off by drawing a, uh, uh, an, uana uh, an analogy with uh, other biological realities. So in nature, there are many instances of actual parasites, actual pathogens that parasitize the brains of certain species. So many of your listeners might have heard, for example, of 
uh, toxoplasma, Gandhi. So this is the parasite that infects the or parasitizes the brains of mice, causing them to uh, lose their innate fears of cats, which is not a good outcome, right? right. There are other types of brain parasites that will uh, attack the brains of ungulates, uh, deer, moose, uh, elk. And when their brains are parasitized by this uh, parasite, they will engage in what's called circling behavior. They literally will, you know, on the spot, just go around and circle in the same circle, and they can't extricate themselves from that circle. And as the looming predators approach, instead of fleeing, they can't extricate themselves from that circle. Well, I take this idea, and I argue, well, humans can also be, by the way, parasitized by, uh, you know, actual parasites, but there's a the more dangerous class of pathogens that parasitize human brains, and those are called idiotic ideas, idea pathogens, right? So because of our higher order cognitive abilities, we have the capacity, regrettably, to be parasitized by idea pathogens. So postmodernism, radical feminism, cultural relativism, identity politics, the culture of perpetual victimhood, the oppression Olympics, uh, biophobia, the fear of, uh, of, of biology. Uh, all of these things are terribly bad ideas that cause people to depart from reality and that can cause people to engage in decisions that are profoundly maladaptive, not unlike the mouse who runs towards a cat when it is parasitized by Toxoplasma gondii. And so the, the point of the book is to first identify these pathogens, these idea pathogens, explain where they arise from. Well, it turns out that they arise in an ecosystem called the university. And this is where, they, where the original infection festers. This is where patient zero happens. And then it starts spreading everywhere so that someone like the accomplished people that you and I both know could become completely parasitized by what I call ostrich parasitic syndrome. Ostrich parasitic syndrome, or OPS, is a class of uh, you know, if you like distorted thinking that causes in many cases, otherwise perfectly rational people to become utterly insane. And so I describe this whole evolution of this disease. And then I offer ways to inoculate yourself against it, to fight against it. And the only way you could do that is through a hygiene of good thinking. And so I offer ways by which you can protect yourself against such bad forms of thinking. That's a very important weapon. <laughs> <laughs> um, everyone this has been god sod uh i've i'm really looking forward to the new book god and i really appreciate you coming on the podcast today today i'm speaking with jeffrey miller he is an evolutionary psychologist best known for his books the mating mind mating intelligence spent and his most recent mate he has a BA in biology and psychology from columbia university and a phd in cognitive psychology from Stanford University and is a tenured associate professor at the University of New Mexico. Thanks for coming on today, Jeff. It's great to be here, Travis. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So uh, what's new in Jeff's world? What's keeping you busy? Well, I'm working on a new book that I think is going to be about long-term relationships and how to make them work better by borrowing ideas from different um, sexual subcultures, like kind of what could mainstream marriages learn from uh, different cultures like kink or polyamory or trad life or the sort of red pill pickup artist scene or even sex positive Christianity. So that's been consuming me all summer is trying to figure out how can you kind of uh, mainstream some of those love hacks right. that different subcultures have developed. And do you think if we were to fast forward, say, a hundred years, um, are we moving towards polyamory or is there a way to make um, long-term relationships uh, a thing of the future as well? Well, I think you can have long-term polyamory. You can do long-term open relationships. Right. Um, my sort of thought experiment about this is, is, let's say we colonize Mars, right? And there's different colonies on Mars, maybe with different sort of mating systems and different sexual norms and different relationship styles, which of them are actually going to succeed best? I can kind of imagine that like a free-for-all love commune is not going to work very well. 
because there's going to be a lot of, you know, conflict and chaos and drama. Um, on the other hand, I think lifelong monogamy is not going to work well because there will be injuries and fatalities and it's going to be hard to keep, you know, the sex ratio in a Martian colony perfectly balanced so everybody can find a partner. So I think we're going to have to have some flexibility about how these things work. But honestly, we don't know, given modern technology and, and ethics, what is really going to make sense for long-term relationships throughout the 21st century. Right. And is, is sexual variety the, the thing that's driving us towards polyamory? I think it's partly a desire for sexual variety and novelty. I think it's partly just there's a propensity for um, boredom and staleness in any relationship. Partly it's that if you're in a strict monogamous relationship, it's kind of easy to take your your mate for granted and to forget what their actual mate value and attractiveness is. And if they interact with other people, you're, you're reminded, oh, you know, she or he is really kind of a catch and other people still appreciate that. So there's, and there's probably half a dozen other reasons why people are drawn to it. Right. And, and are all types of, of males, I, I've been thinking on this uh, issue in the sense of how, let's just say, for lack of better terms, maybe a beta male or an alpha male deals with the idea of polyamory. Are these, are these significantly different? Are these, uh, does this language even come up when you're thinking on this topic? It comes up just because the, these sort of alpha and beta terms are so ubiquitous in, in the red pill world, the manosphere, the pickup artists, etc. And I have, you know, many criticisms of that thinking, like Tucker Max and I had a whole podcast about sort of where the pickup artists go wrong and why alpha versus beta doesn't really make sense for human, for the human species, although it does for gorillas. However, there is such a thing as status, there is such a thing as mate value. And I think people who have different sort of overall levels of attractiveness, right, physical, mental, social, financial attractiveness, are going to have different degrees of confidence about keeping their mate, right? So if you're a real catch, and like you're a guy and a woman is in love with you, and um, she wants an open relationship and to be with other guys, and you're confident that she is really connected to you and is not going to wander off and find somebody who's, you know, more attractive and better matched, then I think the idea of an open relationship will be less threatening to you. On the other hand, if you're very low status and low attractiveness, and you have a real catch, an awesome girlfriend, and she, but she has the bargaining power, right, because she's kind of higher overall status than you, then you might go, well, okay, maybe reluctantly I allow her to do her, to have her sexual sovereignty and to explore other options, because I'm willing to kind of take that as part of the bargain. So there's there's all different relationship dynamics that can feed into this. Interesting. Well, it sounds like <clears throat> it's going to be a really interesting book. I'm looking forward to that one. Thanks. Um, so, and how does how does the like this new? Um, I I, I think it's kind of new. This idea of like VR porn. Um, how how is this going to affect the relationship as? you know, uh, the VR porn and let's just say AI technology gets more advanced. I think this is going to be a huge challenge to relationships, long-term relationships that we're not ready for. I mean, I think there's as much difference between interactive VR porn that might include like compu uh, sort of real-time computer graphic animation right, of potential lovers, and that might even include sort of built-in AI, where there's, there's sort of a chat bot, like, built into the VR lover. That's as different from sort of unlimited online 2D non-interactive porn as online porn is compared to, like, Playboy magazines in the, in the 70s. It's just a whole other level of interactivity, 
And couples are going to have to negotiate what's our view of that, what's our policy, if, you know, what constitutes cheating or infidelity, what am I cool with? Um, couples are even going to have to have talks about different genres of porn that they, that they deal with. Um, how rough can it be? How bisexual can it be? How kinky can it be? How, you know, and I don't think society is ready to have those conversations in an honest way. And I think most couples aren't ready either. And how do we, yeah, do, do we just get them ready by, you know, better education around the subject? Well, it's really tricky. I mean, imagine being a, you know, where, where do you get the sex education? about that do you get it from your parents who don't even really know about Pornhub do you get it from high school you know health class teachers doing trying to do sex education within the limits of what your local school board approves um, do you get it in college I, I don't know um, I, I think it's kind of up to us in the alternative media world, like podcasts and YouTube videos and all that, to start thinking about this stuff. Because I don't even think mainstream media is very well equipped to address these issues without just kind of snickering about it or, or sensationalizing it. Yeah, and it seems like the, um, the mode that they have to communicate with, like the short form conversation, the, the one or two lines here, or there is not the proper platform to be, uh, to be communicating this. No, because people are threatened by it. And whenever you have a, a sort of fear response, like, oh my God, this is, this is going to be a set of tough, tough conversations to have with all future lovers or, or spouses. Um, it takes people a while to get comfortable with that, and they're not going to get comfortable in the in the span of a, a two minute clip on the nightly news or um, some five hundred word you know New Yorker article. Yeah, um, <clears throat> are there a few uh, specific things that generally most people want in a relationship or want sexually to to feel satisfied? Yeah, I think. Um, we have pretty good data on this, both in the U.S. and lots and lots of other cultures. You know, like the top two most desired traits by both men and women across cultures are kindness and intelligence. People also consistently value physical attractiveness, resources like money, um, sense of humor, good character. If they're in a religious culture, they tend to value religiosity. Um, and, you know, the way that Tucker Max and I talked about it in the mate book is basically people are looking for good genes, a good partner, and a good parent. And, and the last one, even if they're, even if they make a conscious decision, like I don't want kids, they still tend to look for the traits that would have led to someone to be a good parent if they'd become a good parent, even if it's not relevant. It, that seems to be kind of instinctive. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, let's talk about uh, religiosity a bit. Um, how how much has uh, religious thinking shaped our our sex drive and and basically uh, the way we approach relationships? I think it shaped it pretty deeply, but not quite as deeply as some people believe. Like, um, you know, I have one foot in sex research, and I'm pretty familiar with sort of the sex positive movement both in sex research and in these different subcultures like polyamory and kink and so forth their view tends to be everything was great in prehistory and humans had amazing degrees of sexual freedom and we didn't have any jealousy and then religion was invented civilization developed and you get the sex negativity and shaming and monogamy and all that being invented. This is their view. That basically, if you could throw off the shackles of religion, then everybody would be naturally like bonobos. And we'd be running around, you know, with sexual freedom and no jealousy and, and no attachments, and that would be awesome. That's their view. And then, like Christians or Muslims or whoever, tend to take the view that, in a way, is sort of the, 
the inverse, that everything was sinful and horrible and a sort of sexual free-for-all until monogamy and commitment and marriage were invented, and those are the godly ways to live, and we're sliding back into a situation of sexual chaos of, as people have lost their religious foundation for their values, right? So everybody thinks that there's a massive change going on. I don't think it's that massive. I think there's always been people who are devoted, monogamous, married folks. I think there's always been other people who are a little more sexually adventurous and promiscuous and, and into alternative relationship styles. And if you read the history of relationships carefully, you can see we've always had this diversity of uh, mating strategies and relationships. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, so one thing about, um, I guess, religious thinking, it seems like uh, there's always been this obsession with the genitalia itself and, uh, and you know, m making sacrifices in some way or, or, you know, affecting the genitals of children. So I'm going to just read kind of uh, basically what I think. I think, well, let's talk about circumcision. The I, I look at this as the most morally reprehensible action still routinely carried out in Canada and the U.S. <laughs> Would you agree with that? I don't know if it's the most morally reprehensible thing. I think it's it's one of the worst things that the medical establishment is involved with. And it's one where North America, at least America and Canada, are the most out of step with every other civilized society. Like, we are the odd man out in terms of circumcision. And, and how, can really, that, how can that be? It's really bizarre. I mean, you know, that historians say, well, this goes back to some sort of sex-negative anti-masturbation campaigns of the late 1800s, early 1900s, when there was kind of a moral panic about masturbation by young men and teenagers that said, this is bad, this is terrible, it's harmful physically and mentally, we have to stop it. And, you know, the whole story about kind of Kellogg's cornflakes was yeah. invented as an anti-masturbation food because it was high carb, low protein, low fat, and that was thought to be kind of a libido killer, which perhaps it is. And um, that seems to have been the point at which America diverged from other civilized countries where they all realized routine male circumcision is kind of a bizarre vestige of uh, religious traditions, and you don't have to do it. Right. Um, and if somebody wants to be circumcised when they get to age 10 or 15 or 30, you know, they could do that, but maybe it's uh, better to give them the choice. Right. Well, yeah, and I get that, like, you know, we used to be stupid in, in some regards, and we did stupid things, but it's like, I like to believe that we're less stupid now on subjects like this, and we uh, we would, you know, look to science for the answers before we go and start hacking at genitals of children. Um, yeah. So, but, but it's so weird. It seems like there's still this stall uh, to want to keep this tradition alive, and... Um, it's I, th I I do think that when our uh, future generations look back at us, they're just going to just shake their head and 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 not not know why we couldn't you know catch on to what's going on in like the Asian countries or or you know in Europe. It, th this just doesn't happen. I mean, only only roughly thirty percent of the males on this planet are cut at birth, and and mm. a lot of people think the number is way higher because they grew up in the West, but. Yeah, it's uh, it's shocking to me, and I, um, I mean, is there, I, I, I guess there's no, there's, I mean, is there any psychological reason why we do things like this to ourselves with without any good reason for it? Um, that's a good question. I mean, the ethics of circumcision, I. I I took a lot of my information from Brian Earp, E-A-R-P, yes. who's a bioethicist so who's written I. a yeah. lot about circumcision, and I think he's, he's really sensible about it, and he kind of debunks a lot of the pseudoscientific um, reasons that people give for circumcision. Um, 
it's we have these cruelty blind spots, right? Where there's some cultural practice that everybody kind of just ignores or accepts, or like I don't want to think about it. Um, and once there's kind of a a tipping point or a phase transition where society realizes, oh, this is unconscionable. What what the f are we thinking? Then everybody kind of goes, yeah, I was never really comfortable with that. I just didn't say anything because it seemed like everybody else thought it was right. cool. And you, you know, like once my girlfriend, who's a vegan, tuned me into animal welfare issues in terms of the food industry, I didn't become full vegan, but I certainly got more selective about what I eat based on my assessment of which kind of animal husbandry practices are, are cruel right. and needlessly cruel. And that's another huge blind spot. I think in 50 years, people are going to look back at, you know, uh, battery cage chickens and go, what, what the hell were they thinking? That's like um, billions of chickens a year just for the U.S. who were kind of yeah. suffering. It's unreal. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, veganism is a hard one for me to approach as a meat eater and, and, a, and as a omnivore. I, um, I do kind of see that that position as a morally uh, probably a more morally superior position when it comes to diet um yet my pleasure drive uh, drives me towards the uh, uh the taste of meat and the appeal um yeah is that kind of what where you're at with that yeah i I've, I've been involved in the paleo movement for a few years and they they are pretty hardcore carnivores like it's not a it's not dinner if there's not steak right. and um I have quite a bit of sympathy with that in terms of how I feel when I only eat vegan food versus meat. However, within a few years, we're going to have this clean meat revolution, um, lab-grown meat that'll be genetically identical to uh, beef, pork, chicken, and will be grown without all these ethical issues of, of animal suffering. And I think at that point... Um, Everybody, hopefully, will be able to say, this is awesome. We can have our hamburgers and steaks, and nobody suffered for it. And and that, I think, is a win-win for everybody. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I ask this question often to all my guests that come on, um, because I'm interested in everyone's take on it. What What is currently the biggest ideological threat to humanity? I think this is a little bit abstract and, and subtle, and it might not be exactly the answer you're expecting from me. But I think the kind of social psychological bias against um, utilitarian thinking about ethical issues and policies is, is actually the heart of the problem at the moment. Let me give an example. Um, I taught a, a class in spring on the psychology of effective altruism. And effective altruism is a movement I'm involved in. It tries to do the most good in the world based on reason and evidence rather than kind of urban myths and emotional stories. And if you're involved in that effective altruism movement, you you end up thinking quite a bit about the long-term future, right? You end up thinking... Any given person who lives 100 years from now is just as important to them as, as we are to our current life. And if those future people exist and have good lives, they'll be grateful for it. Um, and when we confront existential threats that could wipe out our species, like nuclear war is still an existential risk, people tend to think, well... It would be bad if the 7 billion humans currently living, you know, died. But they kind of stop there. They don't think of the potentially trillions of future humans or post-humans that could come into existence if we don't fuck things up in this generation. Right. So I think that's, that's the right way to think about it. Sort of just add up how many sentient beings are going to be affected in what ways across the whole present and future. Right. Here's the problem. If you think that way and you say, here's my argument, people think you're a monster and a sociopath. 
right? There's this really deep bias against thinking quantitatively about people and animals and welfare and, and suffering. Um, you, you actually saw this in the most recent Avengers movie, Infinity War, right? Yep. Where Thanos, the bad guy, is like a delusional, misguided utilitarian. You know? He's like, kill half the sentience on, in the universe, and that'll, in the long run, save a lot of people. And the Avengers are like, we don't trade lives. We don't make those trade-off calculations. We just try to save everybody. And that that's supposed to be the good point of view. Does right, but sense? it's yeah, but it's quite quite a blind perspective when you don't take into consideration you don't you know, the calculation of future life. Yeah, and I counted at least half a dozen moments in that movie when the Avengers could have stopped Thanos if they'd just been willing to sacrifice one life. Yep. And they didn't. And the result is catastrophe. And so from an effective altruist point of view, like the Avengers suck. <laughs> They're terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like this blind faith in this uh, following this this principle regardless of, of the potential outcome. It's I think it's the tale as old as time for humanity. Yeah. And, and you also see this in any contemporary political issue, where if you make the utilitarian argument, like, this is the right thing to do, because it affects most people beneficially, and it doesn't hurt other people that much. Usually people read that as, you're an evil person if you're even able to, th to think that right. way. How frustrating was this Kavanaugh thing? Or is this Kavanaugh thing for you? <sighs> it's, I've kind of stayed a little bit away from it, kind of stayed at arm's length and like tried not to engage that much on, on Twitter about it, except just very, very indirectly with a few <laughs> little dog whistles that you may have noticed. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, sexual harassment, stalking, abuse, and, and rape are, are terrible, and I think it's really important for everybody to kind of level up their understanding ethically of, of how to avoid it and how not to do it. Um, I also think it's important to recognize just the, the deep, deep fallibility of memory and interpretation um, and the way that we kind of rewrite the past given all of our ideological and social biases. And I honestly don't know really who's telling the truth, but I do believe in presumption of innocence, and I do think that um, it, in, this, it's going to get harder and harder as we go forward to attract good people into public office yep. if everything they ever did is going to be subject to a kind of moral standard that is pretty outdated. Like, right. for example, imagine current college students. Maybe they're up for the Supreme Court in 30 years, in, in 2048, right? Um, by that point, either you'll be able to get everybody's complete Google details, their, their whole search history, everything in their emails, every Google map search they ever did, um, every Amazon purchase history. Either that'll be in the public domain which is pretty likely, I think. Um, or people will kind of rediscover some intense privacy ethics. Right. Uh, uh, or, or they'll just realize, hey, everybody's fallible. Everybody's fallible. It's not a question of whether they ever did anything wrong. It's really how many things and how bad were they. As the sort of digital records of our lifetime behavior become more and more detailed and more and more public, we're going to discover that a lot of people are into some crazy shit and have done some pretty bad things. And, you know, the question is, what is, what is actually going to disqualify you from public office? And I think the risk is we enter a kind of neo-Puritan era where any 
15-year-old who thinks, well, I might want to run for Congress some someday, has to be so careful about everything he or she does that they don't even have a life and they don't even get the kinds of diversity of experiences that would make them a good political leader. Yeah. Because they're so, so risk-averse. Right. And I don't think we want, uh, you know, to be governed by a bunch of perfectionist puritans forever afterwards yeah yeah it's a uh, it's crazy that that things like you know brett kavanaugh you know enjoying beer this this seems to be like a negative point against him uh, or even enjoying beer even at that age when you know i i, I just just when I'm I'm assessing this, I I don't see that as a negative trait for a um, someone who's going to be appointed to a position of that stature. I mean, what is he supposed to say that I enjoyed, you know, coke binges, or I've been a pothead since age sixteen? Right. Beer beer is fully legal, and it's a major part of American sort of culture on evenings and weekends, and it's like. There's this pent-up resentment against beer-drinking frat boys that is coming out, you know, all across the country. And I think it's a bad look for the journalists because it makes them seem like, oh, the, well, of course, they were the resentful, you know, college dweebs who right. weren't invited to the frat parties. And so now they're taking their sort of um, revenge of the nerds on anybody who who just ran in different social circles than they did yeah i had to comment on this one i saw so um i don't know who this person is jill uh oh i, I think i lost it now but uh, someone someone posted um uh everyone divorce your republican husbands mm -hmm. yeah and and i i just couldn't stand it. i had to be like what the fuck is going on here um yeah. but it's like that tweet got like one hundred and fifty thousand likes mm -hmm. and sure some of those are gonna like be liking the the comedic aspect of it and maybe there was you know a, a bit of you know, going after the comedy element of it by the tweeter, but there's there's got to be a significant portion of those people that are like, "Yep, divorce your Republican husbands," because you know of what some Republicans may or may not have done. And the idea that a long term relationship could be treated as a sort of political blackmail weapon is it's pretty psychopathic, you know. I mean a a marriage isn't just between two people. It often involves kids, extended families, you know, joint careers and businesses that, that many couples are involved in, in running together. And it makes it sound like husbands are totally disposable and wives are totally disposable. And to me, that's one of the more distressing aspects of that mentality that... Um, you know, uh, it's fascinating, I think, when married couples do have disagreements politically. Like my dad typically voted Republican when I was growing up, and my mom typically voted Democrat. And when election time came around, we would have really good dinner table conversations about issues. And the subtext was always, you're an American citizen, you should vote, you should be informed, you may not agree with everybody in your family, but you should have these discussions not least because they're very informative to your kids as they hear them and, and participate in them. And if, you know, every Democrat woman divorces a Republican husband, um, what hope is there for the future of, you know, bipartisan cooperation? Right. And, uh, and I think those conversations that you were just talking about, I think intellectual discourse in the home is the cure of these, you know, uh, mindless traditions um, or, or even ignorance. I think it's so important, and I think this is, uh, 
uh, one thing I'm seeing, uh, and I could be wrong, maybe it's the early stages of this, I feel like I'm hearing of more families having these conversations in the home about politics, about religion and, and these things, and, and they're allowing their children to challenge them on the beliefs that they hold, as opposed to saying, oh, it's rude to, you know, challenge an, an elder on their uh, on their beliefs or something like that. So I think I think slowly but surely we are... I mean, we are becoming less less religious, for an example, and I think that's because uh, children are, are questioning and, and not being shut, shut down or punished for it. So. Yeah, I think that's right. And it, look, ultimately, look, if you're a Democrat woman and you want to actually have an influence and increase the number of people who vote Democrat, marrying a Republican is kind of a great idea. <laughs> you know, if you're confident that your ideas are right, what better way to convert somebody than to spend like almost 24/7 with them? Um, I th- I think you know a subtext of this woman's comment was the democratic values and beliefs aren't strong enough to stand up to scrutiny within a marriage, right? Or or to convince a spouse that you're right. So you might as well just you know jettison them, right? Huh. Well, I, uh, I think that's uh, what we have time for today, Jeff. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast, and I, I really suggest everyone go and check out uh, Jeffrey Miller's work. And, uh, and when does the new book come out? It'll be at least a year and a half or two years, so okay. it's very early stages. Well, in the meantime, go check out uh, his other books. That's uh, The Mating Mind, Mating Intelligence, Spent, and the 2015 book, uh, Mate. Um, Thanks, Jeff, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in.